Satomi Kataro has to start living by himself to go to high school. The problem is that he's broke. Thankfully, his best friend, Matsudera Kenji, nicknamed Mackenzie, helped him find a cheap place to stay. His favorite thing about his apartment is that the rent is only 5,000 yen. It also helps that his landlady, Kasagi Shizuka, is the same age as him. While settling, he calls his father, who tells him that he was blindsided by his job relocation. As Kataru stares at a childhood photo with his mother and father, he tells his old man to look for someone new there. He then spends his first night living alone in a deep sleep. In fact, he's so tired and maybe elated that his room is dirt cheap that he doesn't wake up when an earthquake shakes the entire room up. The next day, Kataru shows up for work at a dig site and Mackenzie is also there. The two friends have a chat while doing their jobs. Mackenzie brings up that apparently, Kataru's apartment is haunted. Kaoteru dismisses this, saying that no ghost can chase him out of his place even if that's true. While at work, he hears a mysterious voice calling out his name. Curious, he follows it until he steps on soft soil and falls deep into the ground. When he opens his eyes, he sees a woman surrounded by light. She says that she has been waiting for him. He realizes that the voice he heard was hers. He reaches for her hand, but before he can do so, he wakes up in a hospital, with Mackenzie looking after him. It turns out that when Kaoteru fell, he hit his head, rendering him unconscious. Was the meeting with the mysterious woman all a dream? That day, while Kaoteru is walking with Shizuka and Mackenzie to school, an unknown girl is seen taking pictures of them. After class, Kaoteru goes to the knitting club to officially fill out his application form. There he is greeted by Sakuraba Harumi, the club president. Just as he arrives home, Kaoteru meets yet another girl. Meeting girls is all fine and dandy, but certainly not when he's meeting them inside his apartment. Taken aback, Kaoteru asks who she is and how she got into his place. When she doesn't answer, he nonchalantly picks her up and carries her out of his apartment. Strangely enough, the girl gets surprised that he can see and touch her. Then it's Kaoteru's turn to get shocked when the girl passes through the locked door. She introduces herself as Higashi Hong and Sane, the ghost who lives in his apartment. Sana then starts attacking him by using her powers or throwing random things at him, wanting him to leave. In the face of a haunted apartment, most people would be running for the hills now, but that only means that those people aren't horror movie protagonists. Or, well, broke as hell in Kaoteru's case. He absolutely refuses to leave, asserting that finding a cheap apartment is not easy. The two fight over who gets to stay in the apartment, both determined to drive out the other. In the middle of their battle, a girl with a broom interrupts them, crashing into the apartment. She breaks the glass window, causing shards of glass to scatter on the floor. Kaoteru, still not yet finished with his business with Sane, asks the new girl who she is. She introduces herself as magical girl Rainbow Yurika. Kotaru thinks she's a cosplayer, with Sane agreeing with his assumption, but Yurika insists that she isn't. When asked what she's doing in the apartment, she replies that a huge amount of energy is piling up in the room. She also tells them that dark magical girls will try to use this energy for evil. Neither Kaoteru nor Sane buys this, so Yurika is sent outside the apartment. With the weird stranger gone, the two can finally focus on their battle for who gets to own the place. However, Yurika's cries for help disrupt their plans. The girl keeps on crying, asking them to let her in, which basically dampens their fighting spirit. The mood is totally ruined with the weird girl crying and pleading outside. Eventually, the two call it a truce for now and allow Eureka inside. Now I'm inside, she asks them whether they now believe that she is a magical girl, but they honestly reply that they do not. This leaves the magical girl Rainbow feeling disheartened. Suddenly, the floor of the room opens and two mysterious creatures appear from underground. They are followed by a girl named Karano Kariha. Poor Kaoteru. All he wanted was a 5,000 yen apartment, and now he's getting hassled by these cute supernatural girls. Whatever shall they do? Kirita proceeds to describe herself as a descendant of the Earth People and a member of the Karano clan. Underground people who are masters of oracles and incantations. 
Carrie Head then explains that their clan has recently discovered the location of a shrine important to their people, and that the shrine happens to be Kauteru's room. Kirita plans to reward Kauteru with gold bars, but he doesn't give in to this. Not when Kiriha and her clan are planning to invade the surface. While dealing with Kiriha, yet another girl appears out of nowhere. This time, it's a princess. Kautaro makes a lovely first impression on her when his face gets accidentally buried in her chest, so the princess here easily develops a hatred for him. She starts attacking him over this mishap and Kiriha quickly shields Kautaro and the other girls. But she falls short and eventually, the room gets destroyed. The new girl is Faye Millis, princess of the Holy Fortorth Galactic Empire. Just as she's about to use an antimatter cannon that can kill everyone in the room, her underling, Ruth, stops her. She convinces her to ease up as destroying the planet will violate the Intergalactic War Treaty. This intervention reveals that Princess Thiamilis' task is to make the humans swear loyalty to her. Obviously, this will not happen if the princess wipes out said humans. The chaos continues when Shizuka, the landlady, enters the apartment. She sees the sorry state of Kautaru's room and all the other girls who are with him. Fueled by anger, Shizuka gets violent, striking the fear of God and Kautaru and his supernatural motley crew. She warns them that the next time they destroy any part of the building or disturb neighbors, she will make them regret that they are alive. With no other choice, Kautaru tries to explain the situation to his landlady. It's a ghost, aliens, an underground person, and a cosplayer fighting to have his room. In response, Shizuka makes them all sign a contract called the Corona Convention. This treaty is meant to contain the chaos and minimize the damages Shizuka's poor apartment. This forbids anyone from using atomic, biological, or chemical weapons, perform large AoE attacks, among other disruptive attacks. Furthermore, combat between 6 to 7 p.m. and on weekends and national holidays aren't allowed. Sounds pretty reasonable. Ruth explains that Princess Thea Millis is undergoing a trial for the right to get the Fort Torthen throne. A computer randomly generates the coordinates of the territory she needs to lay claim to for the Empire. To complete the trial, she must compel the territory's intelligent inhabitants to swear loyalty to her. With that explanation out of the way, Thagamillus arrogantly demands Kauteru to yield his loyalty and apartment to her, but the boy refuses to budge. No way is he giving up his 5,000 yen room. The other ladies aren't willing to give up either. Sani claims that she's been there the longest and Kiri is bent on rebuilding her shrine there. The egoist Thaimilis makes fun of them for being self-serving while Eureka, the only non-selfish person there, weakly tells them that she has to drive out the bad guys who are after the energy in the apartment. Just like before, her spoil is dismissed by Kauteru and Sine, who just think that it's her cosplay spiel. Soon enough, the five of them settle for having one-sixth of the room. Each six will be worth 180 points, and each centimeter will be worth one point. They have to compete for the points through a card game. The winners get points from the losers and will be able to expand their territories. The one who comes in first will take three points from the last in place. Whoever comes in second will take one point from the fourth placer. And the third placer neither gains nor loses any points. Kiriha explains that they will be holding five games a day and each person will get the chance to choose which game to play. For their first day, Kiriha gets first place. The next day, Kaduro asks Sanning to keep an eye on the apartment for him since he will be at school. At the knitting club, Kaduro tries his best to learn how to knit. Harumi, the club president, guides him and gives him tips on doing it correctly. It is also revealed that the girl observing them from a distance before was just Yurika. Back at Thayamila's home, she observes Kaudaru using their advanced alien technology. She ponders on how she will make him swear his loyalty to her. Ruth recommends her to spend time with him to accomplish this, giving the princess an idea. One day after school, Mackenzie finds Kaudaru sitting alone in the classroom. He asks him why he is there, and Kaudaru replies that he doesn't have club activities that day and wants to relax. Mackenzie wonders why he doesn't just go home already, but Kaudaru does not elaborate. Kiria overhears this conversation through her underlings and decides to cook a meal to help him relax. That night, delicious dishes are served at Kaudaru's apartment. Sane, Thea, Ruth, and Yurika are there as well. Seeing the flavorful dishes that Kiria has cooked, Sane begs Kaudaru to let her possess him since she can't eat, while she's a ghost. Kaudaru agrees. Luckily for him, the possession process is fairly simple. All Sane has to do is cling to his back and they're all set to eat. Everyone has a splendid meal thanks to Kiria's cooking. 
殿とルースの分も用意タロお願い私幽霊だから俺じゃなくても食べ物の味がなすこれどんとこいきまーすあ,あのユリカ様はよろしいの、うん、私の分を<笑>こっち来いよ<笑>俺の分けてじゃあ今度こそ The following day, they all decide to play a card game. While Kaoru goes for a bathroom break, Thidia tells Kiriha that she knows that she's been doing more than just cooking meals these past nights. In turn, Kiriha retorts that she also noticed that Thidia has been devising some plans of her own. The next day at school, Kaoru is shook to the core when four new students are introduced to his class. You already know where this is going. Those new students turn out to be Kiriha, Thidia, Ruth, and Yurika. Happy days. During lunch, Thea and Ruth encounter the most ruthless guys in school, the boys' cheer squad. Two classmates come to their rescue, saying that whoever crosses them always ends up regretting it. Meanwhile, Yurika meets Harumi in the hallways, asking her for the direction of the student club's building. Being the kind person that she is, Harumi guides her. While looking for Kaoteru, Yurika gets surrounded by a group of girls who all turn out to be members of the cosplay society. These girls then take her away. Kaotaru watches these events unfold from a safe distance. Relieved, he thinks that Yurika will now be gone for good. Gone from his apartment, at least. <laughs> when they get home, they play card games once again. In the middle of one, Thea finally loses it and declares that she's tired of playing card games all the time. Kataru agrees with her, saying that he's tired of it himself. In response to this, Kiria proposes that they participate in the school's inter-club obstacle course marathon. Thea and Kataru approve of this right away. According to the rules of the inter-club marathon, each participating pair must be from the same club. Now Kataru has to convince the only other member of his club, Harumi, to join the event with him. Harumi is initially reluctant since she has a weak body and is not the athletic type, but Kaoru manages to persuade her. Anything for that sweet 5,000 yen apartment. As for Sane, how will she be able to participate in the game? Naturally, as a ghost, she won't be able to, so they lay down a rule that she gets to choose a participant, and they can share the same rank. Sane chooses Kaoru. Kiriha is chosen to participate in the marathon as one of the representatives of her club. On the other hand, Thea is able to take over the boys' cheer squad. Thea's technology detects Kiria's dolls in the air, and she plans to intercept them. But according to the Corona Convention, she cannot be hostile toward Kiria. Despite this, she decides to proceed with the attack anyway. Kiria's dolls and Thea's robot engage in a fight mid-air. Corona At the school, Sane, Thea, and Kiriha observe the spectacle as Kaoru trains with his partner, Harumi. Sane explains that Harumi is like Kaoru's princess, and he is the knight. Following this logic, Thea becomes pissed at Kaoru for pledging his loyalty to someone else. The day of the inter-club marathon finally arrives. Kiriha and her partner are off to a good start as they rank first in the competition, knocking the other opponents down. Thea and her partner come second, without Thea really doing anything while her partner carries her, shouting hail to the princess. Kaoru and Harumi are lagging behind, but they are not discouraged by this. Kaotaru carries Harumi and follows the others. Due to her clumsiness, Yurika comes in last, she hasn't even started running yet. The marathon's problem-solving portion stumps Kaoru. On the other hand, Harumi answers it correctly and goes ahead of him. Kaotaru refuses to let Sana help him, and after solving it, he catches up to Thea who has lost the second spot and is now running herself. Throughout the marathon, the participants need to overcome different types of obstacles. Their ranks have been consistently changing except for one person, the undisputed number one, Kiriha. During the marathon, Harumi meets a very tired Yurika, whom she helps to get up from the ground. Yurika remembers Harumi as the nice girl who helped her find her way to the student club's building. Exhausted, Yurika thinks about giving up, but Harumi encourages her to go on. The eighth obstacle course is to balance on planks, but Thea has planted shock bombs around the ground so that anyone who touches the planks is hit. This makes the obstacle even harder than it already is. Because of the bombs Thea placed, everyone is now stuck on the planks course. Many have been blown away and only a few are left to finish the marathon. 
As for Yurika and Harumi, the girls are still stuck in last place. While the pair continues to run, Harumi suddenly falls and passes out. There are no medics in sight, and the only one who can help Harumi is Yurika. There is only one thing she can do, and that's transforming into a cosplayer. She uses a special move called Remove Disease on Harumi to get her back on track. Back at the front lines, Kaoru is all set to become the winner, that is, until he falls to the ground and passes out from exhaustion. The second and third place, Kariha and Thea, battle it out one last time. And for the last obstacle course, they have to duke it out through a Bring Me game. Taylicious Kiriha has to bring an A cup bra or smaller, while Flat Justice Thea must bring in a D cup or larger. Is it even legal to ask high schoolers to? Moving on. Fortunately or unfortunately for them, they don't have to look any further since what they're looking for is just each other. While Thea and Kiriha battle it out, the finish line has already been crossed. And as for the winner of the marathon, it's a tie. A tie between Yurika's cosplay club and Kaoru and Harubi's knitting club. This is the end of Ropujuma no Shinryakusha. Thank you to keep watching the content from this channel. Remember to like and subscribe to keep you updated with our latest content. See you in the next video.